Hi, uh, I'm Subhashish and it's a pleasure to be here for my talk, which really to me is a brief uh, field guide to this very vast discipline that uh, causality and causal inferences. So you see causal questions have fascinated and puzzled us humans in equal measures for maybe over two millennia and beyond. Uh, right from initial work done by uh, grand old man Aristotle to in some 300 plus BC in ancient Greece to work happening at the frontiers of statistics and machine learning as we speak. So um, as I am on my own journey through this uh, rabbit hole, my uh, humble attempt in today's session will really be to give you a you know, whiff of this discipline, hopefully enough to whet your appetite for further self exploration. By the way, uh, in case you are wondering uh, why do we have this you know, curious cat here, I promise to get to that in the next couple of slides. Quick question to get started with the session, hopefully not too obtrusive for the audience here. How many here are really fond of chocolates? A quick raise of hands. All right, uh, we are all in good company in that case. Um, so it, it will be for us very interesting for you, it, it was very interesting for me at least to note that chocolate consumption has this very strong interlinkages with uh, well Nobel Prize winning chances, beat that right. And this is basis a study that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012. What they really do is uh, they plot the chocolate consumption to the x axis and this is by 22 countries and they plot Nobel Prize winners per 10 million to the y. And you note that it almost seems that as chocolate consumption increases. Uh, Nobel Prize winners also increase. It's almost a linear pattern with a correlation coefficient of 0.8. Jokes apart, that's pretty strong as a linear correlation, right? Now, how many in this room really strongly believe that chocolate consumption can incrementally influence your chances of Nobel Prize winning? That few, okay. We have a bunch full of uh, skeptics here, good for science. Um, but uh, wh why not? Maybe chocolate consumption gets my creative juices flowing, gets me intellectually stimulated. Still not? Not convincing enough? Okay, it seems a skeptical audience again. So if there is a fallacy lurking behind the scenes, right, what do you think is happening? Could, could anybody want to take a crack on that? Shia, yeah, please, please sir. Okay, okay. Very nice, very nice. All right, we have one shot here. We'll go on. Okay, so what is perhaps really happening is there's this bunch of factors that could affect both of these variables. One obvious one is the uh, economic state of the nation concerned. So more well-off countries, citizens there might tend to partake in consumption of more luxury goods like uh, chocolates. They also tend to have better infrastructure, investment into education, investment to scientific R&D, which may produce more Nobel laureates. And you know, hence this lurking factor influencing both gives this very interesting strange results. But sorry to disappoint the chocoholics, consuming more chocolate won't get you a Nobel Prize. It's probably correlated, it's, it's not uh, causation here. Now uh, this in fact is one major reason, a lurking third factor that affects two variables that leads to such cases of what we call as spurious correlation. And I'm sure you remember your stats 101 professor telling you that correlation is not always equal to causation. And you see that is one of the reasons why you get to see such iffy results. Um, well, if correlation is not equal to causation, then what is causation and how do we get to causal effects? Now, I did not want to come up with a stiff uh, academic definition of sort, but rather wanted to motivate that using a couple of common causal questions. And uh, I'll focus on one here. Now notice what it's trying to get to. It's trying to answer what is the effect of an intervention, the introduction of a mobile app on a metric of interest which is churn for an e-tailer. And this is the general anatomy of any causal question. You have an intervention or a treatment as we would call it in causal analysis and you are trying to find out the effect of that on an end metric of interest. If you notice the questions all along, that is the generic framework that they always follow. The other thing and that is slightly intended, so forgive me for playing the devil's advocate here, 
you would notice that these questions come from various walks of life. You have questions from public policy, from marketing, medical sciences, epidemiology, economics and so on. And that is because causal questions are really ubiquitous and I am not joking. If you scrutinize carefully, causal questions are lurking in nook and crannies of your life and they will burst out at you. So wrapping our heads around causal thinking is effectively uh, beyond, it will help you beyond this analytics in your daily life as well. But in terms of analytics, why are we really concerned about causality and causal inference, right? This is something that many of you may be familiar with. This is a standard uh, analytics maturity model that Gardner came out with and it shows the various complexities of uh, different types of analysis and the value that they can unlock. So when you start off with you do something very basic like uh, descriptive analytics and so on and working solely on correlation actually will do just fine even up to the point where you work with predictive analytics. You see standard machine learning algorithms do not differentiate between causation and correlation yet you are getting fantastic results right. The point being that when you are moving to the final final frontier of prescriptive analytics where you are really trying to prescribe what would be what can we prescribe to move the business needle? What should be your prescription recommendation? That is why there is a strong feedback that should come in from diagnostic analytics which really is the causal component of it. It really tells you uh, why is something happening and what is the extent to what it is happening. Now to concretize assume there is this causal inferencing framework and you are running a marketing campaign and you kind of understand through that that email notifications lead to lift in sales right. So once you have this wisdom in place, this causal wisdom in place, you can actually action on it. You can recommend to deliver email notifications to drive up your sales and that is the power of causality. Well I am hoping that we have given a broad brush introduction in a nutshell of causality and why do we need causality and so on and so forth. Now causal inference is really what gets you to the deduction of this causal effects. There are more than one analytical frameworks that are possible to deduce causal effects. We will be focusing on just one today called the potential outcome model or the PO model. Like any statistical framework it is based on a bunch of assumptions and we will be focusing on one particular one today. The more such assumptions are met the better your chances of getting to more robust results. Now it is always good to put faces to name and this uh, gentleman that you see here. Uh, forgive the pixelation and so are, are the pioneers of potential outcome model uh, starting from uh, Jersey Neumann 1920s that is when this entire thing began. It died down a bit it was reinvigorated in 70s by Donald Rubin and in fact this model is alternately called Rubin's causal model as well in honor of Mr. Rubin and then again his associates Paul Rosenbaum and Paul Holland kind of uh, took up the mantle. Well. To illustrate the basic uh, essence of the potential outcome model, uh, let us take uh, a relatable example, nothing esoteric, nothing fancy. We have this person who is suffering from headache and he is contemplating on popping an aspirin to get relief. Right? So in this instance, his treatment has really two options, either he pops in the aspirin that he that is what he gets treated or he does not pop in the aspirin, he does not you know go to the treatment. Corresponding to each such treatment options there are hypothetical or potential outcomes possible. So what really happens uh, if he takes an aspirin, either he could get a relief or not get a relief. Likewise for not popping an aspirin. Realized outcomes can only be either you get a relief that is your headache is gone within the next two hours maybe or not or, or essentially not get a relief, your headaches persist beyond the next two hours. He pops in the pill, what we notice is this that the headaches gone. Would our conclusion, forget causality, logical this right, would our conclusion be that aspirin has caused this remission? How many say yes, raise of hands, okay, how many say no? Okay, divided house, uh, all right. So proper causal thinking would probably tell you that we really can't say and this is where the counterfactual thinking num comes into place. So counterfactual in this case is what would have happened had he not popped in the aspirin. Now had he not popped in the aspirin and he had not experienced relief vis-a-vis -vis he had popped in the aspirin and experienced relief 
then there is a difference in outcomes right and that is when you can possibly say there is a causal effect of taking an aspirin. But herein lies the classic fundamental challenge of causality. You cannot have a person in two states simultaneously in the same time. This is not Mr. Schrodinger's cat, you cannot be dead and alive. Likewise, you cannot have a person pop and not pop the pill at the same time. And this is neatly illustrated in this uh, case here. I do not know if it is visible, but what we are really trying to show is we are decomposing the observed outcome and uh, you can the treatment option is either 0 or 1 right we spoke of it. So, if you just plug in either of them you would realize there is one outcome the other outcome will be unobserved it is latent you cannot observe it you can just get one outcome right. So, we are stuck uh, seems that getting into causal reads at an individual level at least is an impossible business right. What do we do we do what we always do in statistics we expand the net and we think about a sample right. So, we move from the individual effects to a sample. So, we look at over a sample and maybe try to get to an average read over the sample. And what would that require us to do? Rather than complicated maths, I wanted to do this graphically. So, what we need is this sample of folks who are suffering from headache, have them pop in an aspirin, have them also not pop in an aspirin at the same time, and observe the percentage experience of relief in each of the scenario take the difference of that and that will be a causal effect. But wow that is again impossible remember the fundamental challenge of causality this cannot happen simultaneously at the same time. What happens in practical real realistic world is something like this there will be a bunch of folks who pop in the aspirin there will be a bunch of folks who do not you get to the rates of relief in each and get to the differences. But the problem is you cannot really call that as causal and why is that so because these two sets that you notice are not comprising of the same set of people they are different they are heterogeneous they could differ in terms of age in gender medical conditions and so. So, despite the fact that if you observe any difference uh, in the rates of remission who knows if it is due to administering aspirin or the pre existing difference in effects. The one thing I wanted to drive home here is that when you are trying to get to any kind of causal effects it will always kind of be a comparison between in this case the treated and the non treated set they will go by different this goes by different nomenclature it could say exposed non exposed treated non treated test control and so on, but it will basically be that and keep this in mind because this will be effective in the next couple of slides ok. So, we back to square one uh, seems that we really cannot get to causal effects well not so fast there is something called randomized control trial or, or something that we call popular in industry as A B testing. What A B testing again does is it takes the set of folks and randomly splits them into two part. Now, when it does this random splitting or randomization what it really ensures is uh, the set of folks in this two subsets they are roughly similar they are pretty comparable between themselves in terms of the overall characteristics which means that now if you take the percentage experiences relief and kind of come up with the difference you can sort of come close to what would be an ideal state. And AV testing in the truest sense are really the gold standards when it comes to getting to causal reads, but, but there is a big but uh, AV testing is not always possible many reasons why first of all due to practical considerations that time uh, you know you as a poor analyst will be tasked with analyzing something for which a b testing was not done it is a retrospective study you cannot turn back time do not have a time machine and uh, you have to work with non experimental data. At times uh, there will be multiple a b tests running over the population which will make it very difficult to tease out the effect of a particular a b test at times cohorting can be non random non random. So, in this case here we have assumed that the cohorting is perfectly random it randomizes. So, there is a homogeneity between these two sets things can go extremely awry and there have been cases where things have been. More importantly though uh, A B testing may be undesirable at times you cannot randomize uh, and randomly assign people to smoke and not smoke to treat out whether they can get, can get cancer or not that is plain unethical. Um, in practical terms I was reading this recent article by the head of data science of Coursera I think Elena Glasberg Sands and she made this very cogent point. So, so 
Coursera has this certificates that I mean essentially if you need to get certificates from them you need to purchase them right you need to pay for that kind of so Coursera as a policy does not do any kind of A-B test for those pricing they actually rely on quasi experimental methods or observational methods we'll get to cover some of them later and try to understand the effect of price differences and what could be the optimal prices to set okay long story short at this point at many a instance you my dear analyst will be left with just observational data and observational data has its uh, own set of pesky challenges the one prominent challenge is called confounding now before getting into any technical artifacts what does the word confounding conjure up in your mind just plain english anybody wants to take a stab at that right sit again confusing okay okay all right all right yes confusing um, befuddling uh, and obfuscating and so on something that makes things fuzzy and confounding here is exactly that so let me take an example assume that we are trying to find out the effect of exposure on an online ad for a brand on purchasing the brand online now there's this theory and it's pretty proved that the more a person is online right more his more active he is online the more likely he is to get exposed to that and also buy the product online right so again you see uh, there is this one variable influencing both the treatment and the outcome. So even if you want to just uh, tease out or uh, kind of find out what is the effect, sole effect of digital ad exposure and buying online, you really can't. There is an obfuscation happening. By the way, we have covered confounders before. In fact, the one that we spoke of in terms of Nobel Prize winning, the economic state of the country was a bit of a confounder here. Um, there is this other example in terms of... Uh, Medical sciences, um, try to, it's the same thing, it reinforces the same thing really where let's say that you come out with an experimental uh, treatment, what really may happen is folks who try out the treatment also are the most sicker ones. So the state of the sickness may affect both trying out the treatment, unfortunately also their mortality rates. So again it's difficult to tease out the effect of trying out the treatment on mortality. There's a confounder here in terms of sickness. So. Um, Synopsizing what we have thus far, A-B testings are the gold standard, though A-B testings are not, A-B testing is not always possible, randomized control trial is not always possible, you will be left with observational data at times. Observational data has this principal problem of confounders or confounding, which really means there is some pre-existing difference between the treated and the non-treated set. I think you get the drift now. Our principal task in terms of causal inferencing, and that's one crucial thing that we always have to do, is to level the field. What we have to do is take off this, this pre-existing difference, mitigate them as much as possible, so as to restore a sense of balance between the treated and the non-treated group, and thus making them extremely comparable. That's what, you know, there's the main funda behind causal inference. Now, this is what is encapsulated by the major uh, causal assumptions. I just have time to cover one, perhaps the, the major one, which is called exchangeability. And I will hark back to the previous example that we talked about. So assume that via research you get to know that it is, uh, you know, users who serve beyond 10 hours a week, they are more susceptible to viewing the digital ad. So what you can do, now again getting back, if you need to get to any kind of causal effects, you need to compare between the treated, or in this case the exposed customers and the non-exposed customers, right? Now what you can really do is keep only to customers who have who are been online more than two hours, more than 10 hours in a week. So effectively what you are doing is you are leveling the field, you are controlling for the differences, you are taking away that source of pre-treatment bias, right? Uh, and that is basically what exchangeability kind of harps on. It tells you that Provided you know what the confounder is, in this case assume we know this is the confounder, you condition it and you condition in such a manner that the treated and the non-treated set, they are exchangeable. There is no difference, pre-existing difference between both the sets. And that's why we call this as exchangeability, right? One quick thing is that here we have assumed that this is the only confounder, may not be the case. 
thing is it could be many things. It could be gender, you know, geographical location, propensity for the brand, and so on and so forth. Now, the more exhaustive and the more covered your list of confounders are, the more your chances uh, the, uh, that you will possibly be able to satisfy such assumptions and get to more robust you know, causal reads. Now, <clears throat> such causal principles are kind of brought to life by different techniques to tease out causal effects. Whole bunch of them, much even beyond what you see here in this slide. I will be focusing though on two of the slightly connected techniques called covariate based matching and propensity based matching. And uh, rather than talking more about in theory, I will uh, try to cover them through a simulated case study. Hopefully that makes it slightly more clear. Try to define the problem first. So there is this retailer who has come out with the same day delivery plan, which is you order something, food, grocery, etc. It will be delivered to your doorsteps in the um, same day. Now the business hypothesis is that customers who subscribe to this program, uh, because of the superior customer experience they get, they will tend to become more engaged, more loyal to the retailer and in the aftermath of subscription will uh, tend to make more purchases. You know, that is the manifestation of the loyalty that way, right. Big question is does this play out and then what is the magnitude of this effect? Now, assume that this program has been launched at month M and we are at month uh, M plus 6 for the moment. So, if this was launched in Feb, we are in August. And what we start off with investigating of course is, and M will be a kind of point of reference always through this discussion, the month of joining. So, what we start off with, who are the customers who subscribed to this program in that given month? There are 5000 or so customers in fact who have subscribed to the program in the given month. Now, what we also obviously want to see is uh, the key question remember is are they more engaged in the aftermath and when we say more engaged it is always a relative question. They are they more engaged with respect to customers who did not subscribe and engagement here is something um, we define in terms of certain key retail behavioral metrics. There are three that we will use here. One is total number of transactions made in this six month phase. The second is spent per transaction, the third is number of items you know bought per transaction. So, we have these three metrics in the post six months phase for the converted customer set. Now, to get to any kinds of causal effects, we know by this time that we need to compare between the converters and the non-converters, which means that we have a set of customers who did not convert, 100,000 of them, a random set from the overall population of non-converters. and similar metrics for them in the post six months period. We also expect that it may be very likely that there are pre-existing differences between the customers who convert and not convert. That is why we also have the similar three variables, transaction spends and items in the previous six months before the you know this program was launched. Overall then we have a data set with about 5000 converters and 100,000 non-converters and over this eight variables, right. What we notice when we drill a bit deeper and try to understand the difference between the set of converters and non-converters is interesting. So, this is what we kind of see, this is, sorry. So, converters are those who subscribe to this program in a given month, yeah, okay. All right. So. This is um, the density plot, a fancy histogram of sort if you may. And the one that you see here is for total number of transactions. The graph to green is for the subscribers or the converters. The graph to pinkish hue is for non-converters. You would note that on average the converters make more transactions than the non-converters. Uh, in the last six months, I mean this is pre, pre six month phase before this program was launched entirely. They made about 35 transactions, whereas customers who uh, did not subscribe to the program may have made about 30 transactions. The same story plays out for spend per transactions. The customers who have converted tend to spend more than customers who have not converted, which means there already is a uh, pre-existing bias of sort, right? Uh, subscribers typically are among the, already are among the better customers. So, we are saying hello to confounding again, right? 
you know, the more engaged customers are more likely to subscribe to same day shopping. They are also more likely to buy more in the aftermath, right. So again, it will become very difficult to disentangle the effect of this program on incremental purchases. If we do not control for these differences, the pre-existing differences that we spoke of, uh, and these pre-existing differences in, um, you know, engage, engagement is manifested by the levels of the three variables that we spoke about, right, transaction spends and items per transaction. Can I take that data after this? It's better if it's covered. Okay, so uh, so this is the crux of it is that how really do we kind of get to the effects of this program on incremental behavior, incremental purchase behavior, right? This is what kind of uh, covariate based matching can help you do. So covariates uh, are a statistical term for what we nowadays call as features in machine learning, and the way it works is something like this. So Assume we have this one customer who converted or subscribed in a given month. These are his salient, you know, behavioral characteristics, the three variables that we have spoken up of in the previous six months phase. And assume for now we don't have 100,000 non-converters, but three non-converters, again their salient behavioral characteristics in the previous six months. Now, if we are to control for engagedness in the pre-six month phase, what we need to do is find out a customer who is very similar to this person in terms of these three metrics, right? That way we would have controlled for the difference that already exists. One way to do that is simple. You calculate the distances between this customer and the other customer. Here we have taken a very simple Euclidean distance in this instance. And what you do is uh, follow a greedy procedure and find out the closest clone of this customer, the nearest neighbor of this customer, right? So what happens then, you see, these customers, one from a converter set, one from the non-converter set, they are very close now in terms of these three metrics. They are almost exchangeable. We have actually satisfied the exchangeability. One can swap for the other. We have also controlled for this pre-existing differences in effects. Now, some quick pointers on in the fundamental nuances before we get into the depths of this. One, I think you realize that this is based a lot on the measure of distance. We talked about calculating Euclidean, not a great thing to do always. There could be instances where, you know, your uh, variables could be in different measures. It could be in uh, dollars, it could, one could be in inches, it could be height, what could be something else. Best to use something that kind of normalizes for that. What's used in literature and in typical in industry is uh, Mohanlovich distance, which really uh, scales the distance by the variance covariance matrix. In fact, better what's also used at times is the robust variant variant of M distance. Uh, it's called robust Mohanlovich, which is a bit more resistant to outliers. It, the other thing is calipers. And this actually is you know kind of caliper. We talked about finding out distances between a customer in the converted set and the non-converted set. But what if the distance is like too wide? And that's not a good thing, right? Would you really want to consider a, such a customer in your analysis because the matching isn't good? Calipers essentially is a distance. What it really says is if the distance between this matched pair, if it's beyond a certain limit, do not include it for analysis. Now whether you want to include it or not is a very subjective question. Come to think about it, uh, if you have to leave that out, you'll probably have more accurate results, right? So you have lesser bias that way. But if you leave that out, you will have a lesser sample. So it's a classic, you know, bias variance kind of a trade-off that you need to take into consideration. The other thing is we spoke of of one-to-one -one matching. There's nothing stopping you from doing one-to-many. In fact, if you do one-to-many, you have more samples, your variance is reduced, but it's a flip now. Uh, if you move from the nearest uh, neighbor to the second to the third, your accuracy of the match is slightly reduced. So again, a classic, you know, bias variance kind of a trade-off. Okay. so. We spoke of the fact and we have kept on speaking about the fact that the fundamental notion is there is a treated and a non-treated or an exposed, non-exposed, let's call in this case as a converter and non-converter set and there are pre-existing differences. So there is a fundamental disharmony, there is fundamentally an imbalance between uh, both the sets and we need to mitigate that. 
Then the first step for us is really to assess what is the extent of this imbalance. So let us take an example, uh, assume that we are trying to find out uh, what is the extent of imbalance between transactions for subscribers and transactions for the non-subscribers. And a classic way to do that would be to do uh, hypothesis testing that we are all familiar with basic inference theory, right? You test for the equality of means and uh, so on. The only thing is that uh, typically the large sample sizes that such studies involved, see the large control group typically, the large group of non-subscribers would often mean that even small differences in means can get very amplified and you may end up rejecting the null hypothesis even if that is the true. So a type 1 kind of error can happen very rampantly. So what is really done in this case is uh, we resort to something of a more effective but also a great measure which is called uh, standardized mean difference. Standard mean difference does something quite simple. It looks at these two groups again uh, transactions for subscribers, transaction for non-subscribers, you calculate the difference between both and you uh, divide that by the square root of the variance, right. So you are standardizing. The other thing is you notice that this is bereft of any artifact of the sample size, which typically a hypothesis test would involve, the test statistic there. So it does not suffer from that defect. General practice there is a, you know, the absolute value of this is taken, the modulus of this. So obviously if this is 0, that means it is kind of a perfect balance. There are some rough rules of thumb from field studies and experimental results. So typically if it is uh, less than 0.1, you are good, you are cool, do not worry about it. If it is more than 0.2, this metric, right, it is then that you start worrying. Things are not in a very good shape. And in fact in our instance, if you look at those three metrics that we are concerned about, um, the SMDs actually are quite high. They are always higher than 0.6 and go up to 1 for transaction. So it is in a bad state. So now we have assessed the fact that there is a severe amount of imbalance in this three metrics of interest. There is a pre-existing difference. Now matching can be used to mitigate that. Assume that we have implemented matching and then what really happens? So then what really happens is interesting the SMDs actually fall to between 0.02 to 0.03 for each of these variables. It is a drastic fall from where it was at in a pre-matching state to where it is at now. This is actually the density plot for transactions and you note now there is a good amount of overlap between the treated and the non-treated set. So it is fair to note now that we have brought in a semblance of harmony. We have almost uh, kind of taken away that element of pre-treatment differences. And what we have now is a clone customer for each customer in the subscribed set. So we have that way 5000 pairs of customers. We have like I told you right, we have 5000 subscribers and we have one a clone from the non-subscriber set for you know each of them. So we have a pair of 5000 that way. Assume that what we are interested in is finding out uh, does transaction get affected? Do we notice any tangible change in engagement in terms of number of transactions? in the post six months of subscription because that is that's the thing that we are concerned about right? what happens in the aftermath of that subscription program. We can do something simple, you can just tabulate the transactions for each you know customer in the set and calculate the differences. The easiest thing to do would be to kind of take an average of that which is something we have done. The average turns out to be about a uh, bit over two transactions. So two transactions, incremental two transactions for the set which subscribed over the set which did not subscribe uh, over six months which means about uh, four transactions over a year and if this expanded over a wide customer base this has quite a bit of an effect it is quite a bit number of transactions. You could also do significance testing just take that with a pinch of salt uh, p values have taken a lot of flack off late and so and legitimately so and it turns out to be quite significant if you do a you know, simple p testing on the differences. We also do the same thing for spend per transaction. The interesting thing that we notice, there is a very small delta for spend per transaction. So what is probably happening is customers are more engaged as in they are making more transactions but they are not spending more money per transactions. But eventually that still meets more engagement. Overall your overall spends are increasing given the fact that your transactions are increasing and so. Now all that is fine. What creates a problem for covariate based matching is when your feature space explodes, right? Um, when you are dealing with too many features, first of all calculating or getting to such nearest neighbors can be computationally complex. 
The second thing is even measures of distances are very fuzzy in such uh, high dimensional spaces, the curse of dimensionality, right? So the thought is that uh, what if we could rather, for now, what we had done was we were taking these vectors, right, these three dimensional vectors and calculate the distances between them. What if we could rather condense this into a scalar, just numbers and calculate simple differences, then we, we wouldn't suffer from such effects, right, and this is the gist of something next that we're going into called propensity score matching. What propensity score matching does is really it predicts the chances for a customer to be part of either of this uh, subscriber, non -subscri I mean essentially part of the subscribers group, right. So it, it produces a score for that. And how does it do that? So we have data for this, the customers that, that they joined in the given month, right. So we have data whether customers have joined or not. So it's a one zero variable of sort. You also have uh, predictors, the behavioral variables of interest, right. What you can readily do, and you see it lends itself very well to a classification kind of a modeling framework, you can use these predictors to actually um, predict the chances of a customer subscribing to the program. And you get a kind of a score, which is a scalar, which you can now use to find out customers who are kind of nearest to each other, right. We are avoiding calculating distances entirely. And this is what we kind of do. What I have used here is something very simple. I have just used generalized linear models uh, or this binary logistic regression model. This is the same old data that you are by now kind of familiar with. Um, as an output from the model, it spits out a score between 0 and 1 for customers to subscribe. And what you can do is again calculate just the simple differences, right, uh, between customers in the subscriber set and the non-subscriber set. Again, guess, get to a close clone. Uh, and you know the same process repeats. Um, practical tip, uh, given that the probability scores are confined between um, 0 and 1, at times it becomes very difficult to find out close clones. It, the variance is very less, it is very closely clustered. So generally what happens in practice is you actually transform the score from a probability space to a log odd space because the variance is more, it ranges from minus infinity to positive infinity and it is quite easy that way to find out close clones, it is cleaner that way. So, uh, we follow the same process. Uh, we do this exercise and in the aftermath of this again we notice that there is a sense of balance that is there in the data now. The SMD is in the range of um, you know 0 0.02, 0 0.03, something similar to what we had noticed for covariate based matching. Um, we also do the same analysis for understanding if there are treatment effects that you know if there is a higher engagement for this customer who subscribe. And uh, we have shown this here only for transactions and you notice again the delta is about uh, 2 point something. So it kind of harks back to what we had noticed for um, you know covariate based matching. Now this is not the only instance where you can use matching. Matching has various use cases. It is very often used in uh, advertising industry especially for understanding the ROI for um, you know, online campaigns, it is often used in multi-touch attribution models to understand the ROI for different digital investments. My favorite uh, instance though is uh, where Heineken had kind of used it to understand uh, the effect of cooler replacements on stores which sell beer, right, to understand whether it leads to any kind of sales uplift for them. By the way, all references for these are given here, so please do feel free to go through when shared. In terms of uh, tooling, so the uh, techniques that we spoke of uh, primarily come from a statistical school of thought and no surprises that they are slightly better covered in uh, R. Um, Python has all that you need to, to kind of build up on it, but for now it is better covered. In R itself I have primarily used match and match it, but there are more options that are available for you to do in R. Uh, I would like to speak about one of them which is called sensitive analysis which I could not get to cover because of the time limit here. But what really happens is that once you have done with matching, so see what we have assumed here is we have assumed that there is this set of confounders, right, this three variables that we spoke of. Uh, but there could always be unknown unknowns, confounders uh, that we are not aware of, so unknown sources of bias. And what may happen as a result is, uh, you know, things could change drastically if uh, you do not account for them. You're, results, your magnitude of results, your direction of results can change. So what may be needed at times is to stress test your model, to understand how resistant your models are to such specification biases. 
And that is what sensitivity analysis is done, it is very important to kind of do it perhaps at the end of the analysis. Um, so, definitely to go through the materials when you can. By the way, uh, like I said, I think I alluded to it, what we have covered in matching is definitely not all, there is much, much more to matching uh, than just this. And uh, there is this companion, uh, you know, GitHub repository I have created with more materials, more uh, documents, the source, you know, codes, etc., and data set for this. I will share that with you. So, please do go through. Hopefully, that will help you get started on your journey in matching. Um, now, quick thing. Does this mean that matching is, is the silver bullet to get to all our causal effects? No, absolutely not. And uh, this is this very uh, interesting case study that Facebook came out with. By the way, this is a quote by um, Cochrane, who is one of the uh, founding fathers of modern statistics. Now, this is very interesting study that Facebook did. What happened is um, they had this about 14 online campaigns that they had run for which they actually had used randomized control trials, which means they're using a gold standard. They have reads on the efficiency of the campaign using RCTs. And what they wanted to do is use observational methods and see how closely can this gold standard numbers be approximated. Now, Facebook had an unique and enormous wealth of data in terms of users. I think no surprise, you guys all know about that. Um, and that's one key thing. The second key thing is, uh, if you go, th go through the paper, again reference is given, uh, they say that each of the campaigns could uh, range users between 2 million to 14 million, which means that you have an enormous sample size which gives you a tremendous power to analysis, right? And they used a fair amount of sophisticated observational methods even beyond what we covered in the scope of the analysis. They used both the ones that we did, but beyond that as well. And despite that, what they saw is that in about 50 percent of the instances, uh, observational methods overstate the efficiency by a factor of 3x. And why is that so? It is basically because of what we spoke of. There could be unknown unknowns. There were un, you know, unobserved sources of bias that were not accounted for in such large scale experiments. So, what this is, is a sobering tale or what this tells us is that you need to be very sure about your data generating process. What is influencing what? How is it influencing? And be sure about the structures. Well, that is a cautionary tale, but I really wanted to end up this session with something that I find incredibly hopeful, which is work happening at the confluence of causal inference and machine learning. And uh, there has been a lot of attention of late on why to push the frontiers of deep learning and artificial intelligence. We need to teach machines to differentiate between cause and correlation and effect of it. Um, much of it has come due to, uh, you know, this a hark back to action by uh, Julia Pearl, who is this big founder figure of the probabilistic school of thought in causal reasoning. This is a very famous book called Book of Why, uh, very interesting, um, you know, definitely worth going through. There already was work happening in bits and pockets um, on machine learning. So, this is a group that uh, Professor Van der Laan leads in UC Berkeley that works on something called targeted learning which is almost the machine learning way of getting into causal inferencing. Of late, if you have been following um, the major AI conferences, iClear and so, you notice that uh, along with ethics, uh, governance, security, causality is one of the major themes that have emerged, right? In fact, in the recent iClear conference that happened in New Orleans in like May something this year, there was this very interesting presentation by uh, this very famous AI researcher, uh, Leo Batu, who works in Facebook. And he proposed coming out of the system uh, that kind of tells you what is the invariant property of, of a kind of a overall system, which means that he's trying to get to uh, measure that kind of calls out spurious correlation and gets to causal effects. Beyond the scope of this discussion, but uh, I've given the link to it. Uh, very interesting the way that they're doing it. And, in general, what I think is uh, we are headed to very interesting times in terms of causal inferencing and uh, you know, uh, very exciting times ahead overall. Thank you for your time. Thanks, uh, we only have time for one question. So. <laughs> All right, yes you, sir. You can connect with uh, Shubhashish offline. Hi, uh, really nice talk. Uh, so, in the example you quoted, uh, what would have been the gold standard? I am not clear because we were still doing A-B testing. It's just that A-B testing was in terms of time and not like, so what would have been the gold standard in AB that testing, case? A-B testing perhaps would have been that uh, 
you actually allow some customers to subscribe and uh, you know essentially randomize between customers and let such customers or send the customers through some subscriptions and keep off some other customers from subscriptions that way. So even in that we would have to do the matching right? Even if you're doing that we have to do the, so matching, so what I got is that the flow was that gold standard is this. If you don't follow the gold standard, if mm -hmm. you just have observation data, you would follow matching, mm -hmm. which I don't think is entirely true. Even with the gold standard or uh -huh. whatever, you would have to do the matching uh -huh. to ensure that the groups are uh, same. divergent. Same, yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that correct? That that's correct. So if you can, if you can do A/B testing, you don't need to do matching at all. Did I get that question correct? No. So I I think uh, Maybe I was saying that uh, even if you can are, we take it offline because can't hear because of the movement. Can, I, we can take it offline. I can explain that to you. Alright, I think, thank you. Thanks.